It was hard to leave the haven of Lemnos. Picture postcard villages, fresh melons, grapes and tomatoes, and hot baths. After the grit and grime of Anzac, these were indescribable indulgences. Another healing delight were the nurses, tirelessly slaving away to raise our broken spirits with a kind word and a smile. Then we heard how Hamilton had been relieved of duty and replaced by Monroe. He had requested more reinforcements and the British government had said no. They wanted to explore evacuation and he said the losses would be too high, but they just didn't accept that. So we arrived back in Gallipoli on the 9th of November and on top of the usual horrors, we now had the cold to bedevil us. Before we were being fried and now it was freezing. We were not looking forward to a long winter in our bivvies. A week after our return, Lord Kitchener visited. You could imagine the rumours that followed. Was he here to order an evacuation? How much longer would we be staying? Somewhere around the blizzard of the 27th, a silence experiment was ordered for a couple of days. Any non-essential work or firing was forbidden. I guess this was to gauge the reaction of the Turks. They didn't seem to do anything out of the ordinary. Anyway, a few weeks later there was no denying it. No order had been issued, but changes were definitely happening. No more supplies were being landed. Hundreds of men were being sent offshore for any type of slight illness. Mules and guns were being loaded onto boats. When entire battalions started to disappear, and there was no point trying to keep it a secret from us any longer. And we were issued with the order. Each man was to leave his trench as quietly as possible when his turn came. We were all to be off-lifted by the 20th of December. They would leave a rear guard in case the Turks attacked, and Auckland infantry would be part of this rear guard, up on Rhododendron Spur with the Wellingtons and the Canterburys. There wasn't time to think about what might happen. There was so much to do. We had to destroy or bury everything we didn't want to take with us. We didn't want to leave anything of value behind for the Turks, so anything we couldn't destroy, we booby-trapped. Not very sociable, I know, but this was still war. We piled our stores up in huge big heaps and we soaked them with petrol, ready to burn them when we finally left. Of course, there were lots of ruses to hide our evacuation from the Turks. There was an entire battalion that would be landed in the day just to be whisked off again at night time. We would hike up and down the hills with packs on our backs. We would light fires and candles and smoke pipes. We even rigged up rifles with dripping water into tins, and they were designed to fire after the last man left. For all our hard work, we were rewarded with an unlimited supply of food. We ate like kings that last night. Salmon, sardines, fruit salad, oranges. Each battalion was broken into three groups, A, B and C. I was in A, the first of the rear guard to leave after dusk. We put sandbags on our shoes to muffle the sound and made our way down onto the beach and onto the waiting steel barges. As the last group was pulling away from the shore, boom, there was an almighty explosion as the huge mine we had left up at the neck was detonated. Instantly, the Turkish guns sprang to life, but it was too late. Their bullets fell harmlessly into the water. At least we had succeeded in this. The Turks were taken completely by surprise. The supplies on the beach were now alight and brightened up the night sky. As we took our final look at Anzac Cove, it was a bittersweet moment. You'd think it would be glad to see the back of that place, right? It's not that simple. We have quite a complicated relationship with Gallipoli. We'd slogged our hearts out up there. We'd given it our all and then we were ordered to give it up. We'd been plagued by flies, we'd been t tormented by thirst. We'd lost our innocence. And what had it all been for? And that wasn't what bothered us the most. You could see what people were thinking. Thousands had paid a much higher price. We were leaving our fallen friends, our brothers, behind. Who would look after them? And weighed heavy on our war-stained hearts. Very heavy. And the Turks, well, we didn't bear them any ill will. Their casualties far outnumbered ours. They had played the game, they had played it well, they had fought fiercely. They 
they were just defending their own country.